So Julian said that we are taking a break from our message in Romans on the foundations of our faith, and technically that's true, but we need to remember that without the death, burial, and most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul says our faith is worthless, our faith is meaningless. Um, what happened in this day, on this day, and over the next two, three days, changed the course of history and is the reason, the singular reason why we are here today. Today is, as you all know, Good Friday. We entered into Holy Week last Sunday when we celebrated Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered triumphantly on the back of a donkey. And over the course of this week, he did many things. He uh, said it is his time to come out. On Thursday, yesterday, he would have had the Last Supper with his disciples um, in the evening. And as his disciples were trying to stay awake after a large meal, they fell asleep while Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray uh, in agony before God the Father, asking, Lord, if there is any other way, Father, if there is any other way, um, let it be so. But nevertheless, let your will be done and not mine. And shortly after he said those words, there came upon him a group of Roman soldiers, along with Judas Iscariot, who had sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. And after a sleepless night, after an agonizing night of prayer, of, 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 of crying out to God the Father, he is now brought before several people to have their reactions before him. And have you guys ever seen one of those high-profile court cases that are televised, right? You know, there was back in the 90s O.J. Simpson. Maybe you haven't seen those ones. Um, a few years ago, I mean, I'm trying to think, there was like Casey Anthony. Um, right now, there's the, the police officer, right, that was charged with, I don't know, with his murder, first degree or second degree. I, to be honest, I, I forgot the exact charge um, over the events that happened last summer. And all these things are highly televised, they're publicized, and some people view them with, with sadness, Right? Some people view them with just emotions and protesting and out there and waiting for the verdict. Others, like the judge and the jury, they have to be nonpartisan. They have to be focused. They have to be focused on the facts. If you guys have ever been selected for jury duty or have been called in for jury duty, and if you're a U.S. citizen, they will call you in eventually or it's an obligation for you to go and show up at least. And before you get on there, they ask you, is there anything in this court case that will stop you from acting in an unbiased manner? And if you say no, because I really don't like that guy, then they'll say, okay, next, and so on and so forth. Yeah, some other people watch it from, from entertainment, right? They show it on TV. They talk about that news at night. Um, it's on, like, you know, the, the Saturday, night, uh, Saturday Night Live skits and the comedy shows, and not necessarily this one, but like the other cases that have been on, right? Some people watch it for entertainment and try to take something out of there. People watch it and have different reactions to someone that's being accused. And tonight we see three separate groups of people that have different reactions to the one who was accused, to Jesus Christ, who was accused for a few things that we'll see in a second. But before we go in there, let me just remind you, and, and, and a reminder for anyone who's listening, this is all part of God's plan, okay? This is all part of God's plan. The fact that Jesus is brought to this point to die was ordained by God and allowed by God and willed by God. It was the will of the Father for all these events to happen exactly as they did in order to fulfill prophecy and also, of course, to pay the price 
for the sins of the world. And so whenever we see certain people saying, oh, if only he had done this, if only he had done this, or they had said this, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. Remember, Peter said that in the garden where Jesus said, I need to be taken in. And Peter said, um, far be it from me, Lord, for this to happen. And he wanted to fight. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Because Jesus knew that this was what was supposed to happen. So let's go into this court session, into these accusations with that in mind, okay? It's all part of God's plan. So we can't think, oh, if only Pontius Pilate had done this. Oh, if only King Herod had done this. If only the crowd and the religious leaders had done this, he would have been saved. That, that's not part of the discussion here. But we can learn some important things from the reactions of these people either way. So Jesus is brought before this guy named um, Pontius Pilate. And let's read from Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 1. And we'll read just the first two, or the first five verses, actually. Let's go ahead and read them all, and then we'll talk about them. Luke 23, verse 1 through 5. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, these are the religious leaders, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Jesus, are you king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. So they accused him of a, of a few things. First, they said that he was a messiah. They're claiming that he is the Savior, the anointed one of God, coming to save them. We all know and we've all learned that the Jewish people were waiting for a Savior. They were waiting for someone to take them out under, from under the oppression of the Roman government and the Roman Empire. And we have to remember, the, the Jewish people didn't think that their Messiah was going to be God himself. Their thing was going to be a person. I mean, Something like 165 years ago, there was someone named Simon Maccabee who uh, rose up against the, the, the Greeks that were above them that time, and he raised an army, and he drove out the Greeks from Jerusalem and from the land, and they cleansed the temple, and that's why Hanukkah is celebrated today for, a lot of, for those who were in the Jewish faith. He, they cleansed the temple, they brought everything back, and he was their Messiah, a Messiah just means an anointed one, someone who's there to save them. And so he was a Messiah. And so they're thinking, this is who Jesus is going to be. When Simon Maccabee did that, they welcomed him into Jerusalem with palm leaves, and they, and they started quoting um, um, uh, uh, the song that says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and Hosanna. And so you see the similarities between this person who was a Savior a hundred plus years ago, and now they're saying, okay, Jesus might be someone like this. And that's why they welcomed him into Jerusalem with palm leaves. And we saw the kids over here last Sunday with, with the, 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 the plastic leaves, you know, waving them back and forth. And the people back then were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, finally someone to save us. And it turns out that their reaction was disappointment. The reaction was anger even. They knew that this charge, though, wouldn't stand before Pontius Pilate. Because you see, Pontius Pilate would have just told him, this is a religious matter. I don't care about this. I don't care that he is blaspheming God and he claims to be the son of God and that he claims to be uh, God himself. I don't care. And so they went on. And they said, okay, well, guess what? He's also telling us, he's, he, he's telling us to not pay taxes, which was false, of course, because when Jesus was confronted with this, he said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God. So they were lying. But then they also said, well, you know what, Pontius, Mr. Pilate, um, he's planning a rebellion against Rome. He wants to rise up against you. He's claiming he's a king. And this wasn't exactly the case. Certainly his disciples were arguing amongst themselves who would be the greatest, and they thought it would be an earthly kingdom, but Jesus never encouraged this. He said, that's not what I'm here for. 
I'm not here to, over, to overthrow the Roman Empire and to be a king here on this earth. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this world. And so ultimately, they brought Jesus before Pontius Pilate with false accusations. They brought him before Pilate with lies. They were angry. And they were disappointed by what Jesus had done. They came and they were angry because God didn't meet their so-called expectations. Have you ever heard maybe your parents, maybe a friend say, you know, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed? And they look at you and they just kind of look down the floor then and, you know, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you, Julian. I just, I'm disappointed. I expected more from you. Sometimes we have the temptation to act that way with God. Sometimes God, and I put this in air quotes, disappoints us. God disappoints us. He wasn't our Messiah. He wasn't the person that we thought he was to be. Usually when that happens, it's because we come before him with a deal that has our terms, our conditions, and then when God doesn't meet those terms and conditions, as if he is uh, um, uh, bound to them, we become angry at God for breaking something that we placed on him. And we become disappointed. Sometimes we say, you know, it, it's not fair that those who are evil, those who aren't Christian, are blessed and seem to be doing well in life, and I'm over here struggling. It's not fair that I've prayed for God to help me through this temptation so many times and through this, this, this sin in my life so many times, and he hasn't helped me, and God has failed me. Or we say, I've prayed for something over and over again. I've prayed for a family member. I've prayed for someone else to change, and it hasn't happened, and God has failed. And some of these are real examples. I personally know of some people that have prayed for their family members to change, but because they didn't, they stopped believing in God. Tragic, tragic. Sometimes we come before God and we are disappointed because we don't fully know God. We don't fully trust God. When God does not act in the way that we think he should act, it's not because he is unable to do so. Rather, it's because he chooses not to. He simply chooses not to. And it could be as simple as that. I think the sign of a mature Christian and the sign that we have faith in God is when we might pray for something, and we might want something done in our time, but God says, I'm not going to act on your time. I'm going to act at my time. I'm not going to act based off how you say in your terms and your conditions. I'm going to act on my terms and my condition. You see, God sees and understands. God sees every detail of our lives, and nothing takes him by surprise. He ordains everything. In Isaiah 53, 11, it says this. Here's how detailed God is about how the world works and how things are set in motion. Isaiah 53, 11. He says, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. God says, you know what? Not only do I, do I count uh, or call someone to go from one land to another, I also tell a bird, an eagle, to go this way and that. That's how detailed God is. That's how he ordains things. Yet we come with our plans and our expectations, and when they aren't met, we can become disappointed, we can become angry, and that anger and disappointment can lead into sin, can lead into building up a barrier of mistrust between us and God because we're not believing what the Word says. We're not seeing the Father for who He is. Remember this, though, in Romans 8.28, it says that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It reminds me of the story of Joseph, where in Genesis chapter 50, his family comes and his brothers bow at his feet and say, please be kind with us. We know we betrayed you. And we've done evil to you. Have mercy on us. 
And Joseph says that classic phrase, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God turns it to good. We're short-sighted, guys. We can't see that far in front of us. The thing is, the leaders and the people had the scriptures at their disposal. They had these prophecies. They knew what should, or they should have known what was to happen. Yet they had their own ideas, their own concepts about God. And if you're just one degree off of the truth about who God really is, then you don't really know God at all. Because God is absolute. God is not one degree of truth to this way, one degree of truth to that way. Because guess what? The, the, the more you walk in your spiritual journey, the farther off you'll be in your trajectory from God, even just one degree. I pray that we know God, amen? I pray that we search for His will. And as Jesus said, let your will be done and not mine, amen? This is what we need to understand from their reaction so, Pilate is caught in a tough situation because he says, I find no guilt in this man. Jesus answers his question very vaguely, right? Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you've said it. Said what? What exactly? Like, are you agreeing? Are you disagreeing? And Jesus says, you've said it. It is as you say and so Pilate looks at the situation and says, uh, you know what, let me, let me try to find a way out. And so in verse 5, he hears from them that Jesus is actually from a region called Galilee. And the light bulb flashes over Pontius Pilate's head, and he says, oh, Galilee, perfect. That's not my jurisdiction, right? Jesus has to go to another judge. He has to go somewhere else because, you know, I'm over here in Gwinnett County, but Jesus is actually from Hall County, so we got to send him up there because that's where all these crimes kind of happen, right? So, good. Let me get him off my plate and send him over to someone named King Herod. King Herod, um, otherwise known as King Herod Antipas. And here's what it says in verse 6 through 12. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign or a miracle or wonder done by him. So he questioned him at length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribe stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. King Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great, this is the same King Herod that was responsible for the death and the beheading of John the Baptist. Remember, we looked at John the Baptist um, sometime last year in the fall, and we learned that he didn't do so willingly. He was kind of put into a corner because he made a promise that um, whatever you wish, I'll give to you even up to half my kingdom. And that wish ultimately brought about the death of John the Baptist. And we see through other parts of Scripture that King Herod actually thought that Jesus may have been the resurrected John. You see, that's what guilt does to you. When you do something you know you shouldn't have done and you hear about someone, you're like, oh no, this is it. It's coming for me. It's payback time. And so he thought Jesus was perhaps a resurrected John the Baptist coming to uh, um, uh, be vengeful against him. So he wanted to meet him. He was very concerned about Jesus. He was very concerned about what he was going to do. After Jesus came in, that concernment started to turn to curiosity. He's like, okay, I see he's not John the Baptist. Let me see if he does some signs and some wonders. Let me, let me play a little theater here. Once he saw that Jesus wasn't talking, he wasn't trying to do like John the Baptist did when he said, what you're doing with your wife is not good. You're living in adultery. Jesus was silent. He didn't say anything. So King Herod's like, okay. I've gone from concerned to curious. And... Um, now I'm just amused. Now I'm just going to have fun. And what he does is he puts on 
kingly clothes and fine linen on Jesus as a mockery and sends him back to Pilate. The Son of God was before him. The Savior of the world was before him. And it's good to be concerned when you're before the Son of God. It's good to be curious before the Son of God because you want to know what Jesus is about. But ultimately, for King Herod, it turned to just plain amusement. It turned to comfort. He was comfortable with Jesus. He knew who he was now. He's just a man. Get him out of here. And you know, in doing so, he, I believe, violated the third commandment of God, which is don't take the Lord's name in vain. He took it too easy. He mocked Jesus. Many times we, we read that, that verse about don't take the Lord's name in vain, and we think, okay, well then, you know, don't curse, right? Just don't curse, and that's what that means. Well, it's a little more than that. Exodus 20, with verse 7, says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Vanity or vain means empty, hollow, uh, without meaning, worthless. In the eyes of King Herod, Jesus was worthless. He was a nobody. He was just a man. He was someone from his region. And he saw now that he was bloodied, he was beaten, he was bruised, he was uh, uh, bleeding, he was exhausted after a night of no sleep, partially naked, with people yelling at him, spitting at him, mocking him, and he's there silent. And instead of feeling pity for this man, he decided to continue that mockery. And there's many different ways that we can take the name of God in vain. Um, in the Old Testament, taking the name of God in vain meant, like, if you made a promise, like, I promise this and this and this, and if I don't, so help me God, right? And if they wouldn't do that, there would be a penalty for it, because you're promising by the name of God. And God's name, uh, in, in Psalm 111, with verse 9, says that it's holy and awesome. And God, when he makes a covenant promise with Abraham... He swears by the highest name there is, by his own name. He says, I promise on me that I will fulfill my covenant with you, Abraham, because there is no other higher name. There is no other higher standard on which to make a promise, right? There's no higher collateral. When you enter into a mortgage or you get a car or something, you're like, okay, what's the collateral, right? If you don't make your payments, what do we get? Um, a house, a car, some property, something that's worth value. And God says, there's nothing worth more value than my name. God's name is precious. In fact, certain Jewish people won't even say the, the name of God out of fear of disrespecting it or saying it in a, in a, in a, uh, um, in a way that's in vanity. And if you see it spelled sometimes, if you go on certain websites and you look at Jewish theology or whatever, you'll see some people type G D because you don't spell the name of God even. Now, for us as believers, it's okay to say Elohim, Yahweh, and the names of God are found in the Bible. And Scripture says, just let your yes be yes and your no be no, okay? Because you're children of God. You're representing God. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. But unfortunately, sometimes we still take, take God's name in vain for our own personal gain. You think about the, um, just for example, televangelists that go on um, online, make videos to send them donations so they could purchase their, not their first jet, but their second private jet. Yes, this is true. I've seen it. They have one jet, but in order for them to be more efficient, they need another $70 million. And you know what? These, these guys, I'm just going to call them guys, okay? They're so persuasive that after listening to him for 20 minutes, you're like, you know, he's not completely wrong. They have a way with words, okay? They have a way with words. But they're doing it for their own gain. They are. $70 million from people that watch their shows, from elderly people, from seniors, from whoever. $70 million. Use it for their own gain. How many times do we use it for our own gain, though? Let's turn to us. We see all the time in businesses where 
it's good to have, you know, the sign of a fish next to your business or on your car or something, or um, a Bible verse on your business or whatever, something that brings you gain. But guess what? The minute and the instant that you start acting in a way that's not Christ-like, you're taking God's name in vain. Not just for that sticker, but because you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside you and you're representing him. It's not so much what you do with God's name, you know, swearing, cursing, which are, are very important things. Don't get me wrong. It's not so much what you do with God's name, but what you do in God's name that matters. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. When you say one thing with your mouth, but you live in another way. If we profess to be Christians, but we act, we think, we do things in a manner that's not after Christ, we're taking God's name in vain because we're not representing God. We claim to be followers of Jesus, yet we act nothing like Jesus. And he's before us, and it's good to be concerned when God is before you and you have to examine yourself. And again, even curious to know God and to be with him. But when you become comfortable with God and you become complacent and you get used to God after coming to church year after year after year and time after time after time and you get used to God, that's when things can go downhill quick and we can turn into mockery, not just by the things we say, but the things that we do. So the crowd and the leaders were angry. King Herod was amused. And now he's brought back to Pontius Pilate. And here's what the Word of God says from verse 13 back in chapter 23, Luke 23 with verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, Behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent them back to me. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. And in verse 18, it says, But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas. A man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish him and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. In another passage, in Mark 15 with verse 15, it says that Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd wishing to satisfy the crowd. He delivered him to be crucified. Now, Pilate is a very interesting person to look at because on the one hand, the texts and the historical documents and even Scripture show us as a man who um, um, is actually pretty ruthless, pretty violent. Earlier in Luke 13, it says that he had murdered Galileans as they were offering sacrifices in the, on the altar and desecrated the altar because the blood of the Galileans was on there. This man who didn't really care wanted things his own way. But we see now that instead of doing his job, instead of being a governor, of being a judge, three times he said, he is not guilty. May wa men boon. Right? Nuivinovat. He's done nothing to deserve death. You know what? Let's, let's whip him a little bit and flog him, which is extremely painful, but you know what? He's done nothing to deserve death. But while the crowd was angry and Herod was amused, he decided to appease the people. Appease the people. It just means he gave over. He gave in. He caved in. He gave up. 
He said, you know what? Let me keep the peace here. Let me keep the peace and just do what the people want because I don't want to get any more um, uh, heat for this than I need to. That word appeasement is a very interesting word. When you Google the word appeasement, and you go to image search, or not even there, but just in the main page, the first person that shows up is a British prime minister named Neville Chamberlain shaking hands with Adolf Hitler. What he tried to do after Hitler had conquered Poland, unprovoked, and everyone was demanding, do something, this person is guilty. Neville Chamberlain said, you know what? I don't want to make things more political than they already are. I don't want to have any more heat. Let's just come up with an agreement that this won't happen again, okay? And so the policy of appeasement was put into place, and he literally had a photo opportunity with Hitler, shook his hand, and it was popular at the time, but it wasn't the right thing to do. And we know the history of what happened after that. Literally, a person's name is associated with the word. How crazy is that? And we see here that no matter what Pilate had done in the past, he became known as a person who was derelict, who was um, irresponsible of his responsibilities. He didn't follow through on what he was supposed to do. He gave up. He caved in. He gave in to the peer pressure of the crowd. He gave in to what the people wanted. He had the authority to stop it. He had the authority to, to uh, um, uh, release him but he wished to satisfy the crowd. Who's the crowd for you? Who's the crowd for you in your life? You know, we have, for me growing up in, our, in, in church and in faith and in the gospel and knowing what I believe in, and throughout middle school and high school, you know, I considered to have a strong faith, as strong as it could be, morals, didn't want to compromise on certain things. When I entered into college, you know, out of the view of my parents, and I lived on campus for a while, and I was alone. I saw that there was a crowd trying to get me to do things that I didn't need to be doing. And the temptation was absolutely real. The crowd was absolutely real. The things they wanted you to say, to agree with, to do, contrary to what was right, to what was the truth. And it's in those times, it's in those times where you have to go before Jesus and say, Lord, you were tempted as was I, yet you did not sin. And Jesus showed us that there is a way to live a life that is holy, to live a life that is pure, to live a life with strength and in victory, when Jesus gives the help, when the Holy Spirit helps us in those times. The crowd will try to push you. The crowd will try to get you to think the way culture thinks. And again, I don't know who the crowd is for you. It could be friends. It could be people at work. It could be people in another institution. It could be neighbors. It could be someone that's trying to get you to do something that you know in the heart of your hearts, everything your parents have ever told you, everything Scripture has ever said, that you should not do this. And those times will come. And during those times, we have to take a look at ourselves and to step back and say, in the name of Jesus, I have the authority to say no to these things. In the name of Christ, I can say no and I can stand firm. Not by my own power, by the power of Jesus, amen? We say, get behind me, Satan. God has a plan with me. God has a purpose for me. He has brought me to this point for a reason. And Lord, it's hard, but Lord, you can give victory as well because there's nothing that, you, that you're allowing me to go through right now that you won't take me through, amen? That's the promise that we have from God. For Pontius Pilate, he decided to take the easy route. I say, fine, just do with him what you will. I'd like for us to stand up and invite the worship team up here as we get ready to close with a few songs and prayer. There's actually one other person whose reaction is not registered and not found here in this passage. We spoke about the crowd and the leaders being angry. 
We saw that King Herod was amused by Jesus. We saw that Pontius Pilate gave in to appeasement and just let things happen, no matter the consequences. But we see one more person. Barabbas. Barabbas, who was truly a murderer, truly someone who was trying to rise up against the government. We find him in this situation as well. And yet, for whatever reason, his reaction to his encounter with Jesus is not registered. I like to think, this is my interpretation, that's because we can see all of us in Barabbas. And he doesn't have to say a word because what happened with him represents exactly what's happened to each one of us. Barabbas was condemned to death. Barabbas was condemned to die for what he had done. And the crowd had a choice. It was a custom in that time for the governor to release a prisoner on this holiday just to keep the people happy, someone that they felt was wrongfully accused. So he gave them an option. He said, do you want Jesus of Nazareth or Barabbas? Do you want this man who I say is not guilty or do you want this man who has been tried and convicted and is guilty? And Pontius Pilate was probably thinking, here we go. Now I'm going to I've got it all under control. They're going to choose Jesus. And yet they said, crucify, crucify him. And his reaction is not recorded, but we see from popular films like The Passion of the Christ where, you know, Barabbas, as he steps, he looks back and he has a moment of recognition with Jesus. Or in other popular older movies where Barabbas eventually meets with the Apostle Paul and he becomes saved. Those are Hollywood interpretations. We don't know what happened with Barabbas. We just know that he was meant to die, but he was given life. We, meant, we know that he was condemned to death for something he was absolutely guilty of. And yet he was given the gift of freedom by none other than God himself, who didn't say a word, didn't say anything to defend himself. Isaiah 53 said that like a lamb he was led to slaughter, not saying a word, because he knew this was the will of God. My friend, maybe you find yourself in the crowd. Maybe you've been angry or disappointed with God. Maybe you've been too comfortable with God, too comfortable in church, not taking God seriously enough. Maybe the crowd has pressured you to think about God in a certain way. And you've said, okay, fine, I'll give in because the pressure's too much. Whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever reaction you have to Jesus on this Good Friday, we all share this reaction of gratitude and of thanks. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all condemned to death. We were all meant to die for the sins that we made. But Romans 3, 24, but we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's what's so good about Good Friday. It was an exhausting day. It was a terrible day. But what happened because of that day was so good. And we say God is good and He is truly good with us. Amen. I want to end with just a few verses from a song that... Um, we won't sing it or anything, but it's in Romanian. So if, if you don't know, I'll do my best to translate it. And we've sung it many times. But it gives the reaction of three different characters in this song. Their reaction to Jesus. Pe crucea din dealul iubirii pe culme a lipsită de flor. Se stinge făclia iubirii privind spre albastrele zări. Te plânge izvorul din vale și roaza de soare în iamurg. Se scutură florile în cale și stelele toate se ascund. All of nature is trembling at this. The skies go dark when Jesus dies. 
the sun hides its face. The ground begins to shake and tremble. And that's how the nature, the creation of God reacts to the death of Jesus. And the song goes on. Doar mama aleargă la cruce, privește spre cer suspinând. În locul să-i rabde s-ar duce pe lemnul de groază murind. The mother of Jesus Christ was there in that instant that he died. I will gladly go there and suffer in his place. The disciples gone, terrified, scared that they were next. That's how they reacted. Here's how the Savior reacted. Iar ochii ce au plâns în grădină se îndreaptă spre cer, rugător. Spre cel ce durerile alină se îndreaptă al meu salvator. Părinte al iubire sublime, o iartă cumplitul păcat. Al meu duh se îndreaptă spre tine, o iartă că nu știu ce fac. And that was the reaction of our Savior. The reaction of our Savior was to look to them, to you and to me and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. My friend, in this evening, what's your reaction to Jesus? What's your reaction to Jesus on this Good Friday? Knowing full well that He bore upon Him, upon Himself, the full penalty for our sins. We deserve death. We deserve condemnation. He chose to follow, to follow the will of the Father and pay the price for us. Will we respond to that with gratitude, with thanks, with prayer, with lifting up our hands and say, Hosanna, Lord, thank you for saving us. Hallelujah, thank you. Will we come with gratitude before God? Or will we complain? Will we be angry? Will we be disappointed? Will we be too comfortable? Will we be peer pressured by the crowd to think otherwise? What will your reaction be in this evening? I say on this Good Friday, let's take a solemn moment to look at ourselves, examine ourselves, and react to the Holy Spirit right now that's talking to you and is talking to me. React to that nudge, that gentle push of the Holy Spirit, indemning you to look to the Savior. What will your reaction be?